Hello and welcome. On behalf of CME Outfitters, thank you for joining us today for this CMEO briefcase titled Employing Multimodal Pain Management in a Low Resource Setting. Today's program is supported by an independent educational grant from Opioid Analgesic REMS Program Companies. I want to start by introducing myself. I'm Dr. Jonathan Gouri. I am at the University of Arkansas. I've been here for 10 years, and I am a chronic pain medicine physician and an associate professor of anesthesia. I have a wonderful faculty member with me, and I want to give her a chance to introduce herself. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, my name is Dr. Stephanie Vanderpool. I am also an associate professor of anesthesiology at the University of Tennessee Graduate School of Medicine in Knoxville. Um, I am uh, honored to be participating as faculty on this very important topic and excited to talk about some of the concepts we're going to be covering today. That's great. I'm looking forward to the conversation. Um, I want to go over our learning objectives. So at the end of this case, we hope that you're able to educate patients about their pain, their pain treatment options, and really optimize safe and effective multimodal treatment plans for patients who are having acute pain, chronic pain, or acute on chronic pain. And with that, I'm going to pass the floor to Dr. Vanterpool to talk about our case today. Thanks, uh, Dr. Gori. So let's talk a little bit about our uh, patient who's coming in to see us in a primary care clinic visit. Um, the patient we're presenting today is uh, Jackson H., He's a 54-year-old male with a history of chronic low back pain, and he did have a lumbar fusion two years ago, L3 through L5. Um, his pain improved a little bit after surgery, but how now he's gotten worse, especially over the last year or two. Um, the surgeon says that he didn't really attend his follow-up appointments and didn't follow up with PT as scheduled, and the patient states that this was mostly due to transportation issues at the time. Um, he reports that he wasn't able to keep his job or he lost it because of his you know, multiple factors, and he also lost his primary insurance since surgery. So now his current income is from disability benefits as opposed from a, a vocational employment. Um, he also is recently divorced and feels depressed overall. Now, one thing before I get into the rest of this history is I want to highlight the way the history is being presented. This is being presented in what's called a script history format. So that's your story, your current symptoms, relevant medications, interventions, physical therapy, and tests. And the reason this is important is because so often patients come into our offices with um, a story that's all over the place, and we're trying to gather the relevant information in an efficient fashion. And so this template, called the script history template, really allows you to gather information from your patients in a way that no matter when they give you the information, you can just plug it into your EMR and make sure we're not missing anything critical. So what we've talked about so far is the story or the S part of the script history. So now let's dive into his current system symptoms or what he's reporting. The patient currently complains of a burning sharp pain in his low back. It's located at and somewhat below the belt line, and he has numbness and pain radiating to his right leg. It's worse with walking, and he's having some difficulty with daily activities, such as getting the mail and going to the store. He also has difficulty sleeping due to pain and is unable to find a comfortable position in which to sleep. So that gives you your story and your current symptoms out of that script history. Now let's move on to relevant medications, or the R. He's been prescribed hydrocodone acetaminophen, 10 325, and he's been prescribed to take it up to four times a day. But he says he doesn't like taking it because it actually makes him feel a little sick to his stomach. He does, however, um, also have a prescription for gabapentin, 300 milligrams BID, but he's also not been taking that on a regular basis. He does, however, take religiously his high-dose aspirin product, which is aspirin 845 milligrams plus caffeine as an extra strength pain reliever that he gets from the gas station. And he takes about four to six packets of this a day. And he finds that that's the thing that helps him the most. So we've done story, current symptoms, relevant medications. Now we move on to interventions. As you mentioned, he had a lumbar fusion surgery, L3 through five, and that was done two years ago. No other interventions or pain injections since then. In terms of physical therapy, we would already know that he wasn't really compliant with physical therapy after surgery and had um, just a couple of sessions after his fusion, but didn't really follow up post-procedure. Um, he also is mentioning, as mentioned above, difficulty with some of his regular tasks and activities. And in terms of tests, he really hasn't had any updated imaging since his surgery. So that's his script history. A pretty run-of-the-mill, I would think, patient that's coming in with low back pain after having back surgery and still not seeing the functional improvement he would like to see. 
So Dr. Gorey, what did you think about that script history presentation? Do you think that that's helpful in terms of kind of presenting a picture or a history for your patients when you're working with um, in a team-based approach, communicating that history? What are your thoughts? I think it's outstanding because it really allowed me to follow the story really well. And uh, when I think about this gentleman, Jackson H., um, this is, I, I, I feel like I see this patient almost every day. Um, and, and practicing in the Southern United States, it really outlined a lot of the issues that we see um, as we see patients and kind of making sure that these patients have access to high quality pain therapy, even though they may be low resource, but they also are living in an area that's relatively low resource. So I think it was outstanding. Um, right. Do you want to cover a little bit more about his uh, history and physical exam? Sure thing. So now that we've gotten his history part, we're going to talk a little bit more about what are some of the factors that contribute to his presentation. So another key component, as you know, about a history is figuring out what their social history is. In this case, some relevant social history points, we already know that he's not currently working and he's on disability for his back pain. But we also need to know that he smokes about a pack and a half a day and has about a 40 pack year history of smoking. He also has mentioned, was mentioned in the, in the script history is recently divorced. And we know he's got some psychosocial components in terms of feeling depressed and sad because of that. So that's kind of the overall picture for a gentleman before we move on to his physical exam. In terms of his physical exam, he's alert, well-nourished, but he smells strongly as cigarette smoke. And that kind of goes into his pack and a half day um, habit of cigarette smoking. He also has some yellowed fingernails, which you often see with very um, uh, smokers, uh, patients who smoke a lot of cigarettes. Um, but interestingly, he seemed, it didn't seem to affect his wound healing. And remember his, his lumbar surgery is two years ago and his lumbar incision seems to be well healed. In terms of his exam, in terms of palpation, he does have pain in his low back in terms of palpating at and above and below the belt line on both sides of the lumbar spine. He does also have limited range of motion of the lumbar spine. It's painful for him to bend forward and to extend. His lower extremities seem like they have a little bit of loss of muscle mass, and he does report some tingling and weakness radiating to the back of his legs and starting kind of at the surgical incision and then through the buttocks and down into the back and sides of the foot bilaterally with the right side being worse than the left. And then when we did our straight leg raise, some of our kind of more uh, uh, investigative neurologic uh, exams, um, we're um, finding out that he has a positive straight leg raise on the right side. And he also has what appears to be some weakness on the right, but we're not sure if that's because of pain or because of actual neurologic weakness. So that's kind of the overall picture of our patient in our quick assessment between his script history and his physical exam. Thank you, Dr. Vanderpool. I think that was absolutely, that was a great presentation. And one of the challenges that we often face when we see patients like this is we're oftentimes really limited by kind of the assessment tools that we have. You know, pain is so, so subjective. And so measuring patients off pain scores when they've had such an extensive pain history can be really challenging. And it also makes it challenging to track progress because, you know, someone having a bad day, we only see small snapshots in time instead of really seeing the whole picture. Uh, you've really been an innovator in a number of ways, but in some of one of them is how you ex how you assess patients. So can you talk a little bit about um, how you assess functional status and kind of how patients are doing a little bit more objectively? Absolutely. So I'm glad you brought that up because one thing you'll notice was missing from that history was there was no mention of a pain score anywhere in that history. Did you notice that? Mm -hmm. And that's intentional. And the reason for that is because pain scores are so subjective. They are absolutely real to the person who is experiencing it, but it's so hard to quantify. So one of the challenges we face as interventional pain physicians and targeted pain treatment specialists is that we want to be able to objectively document the, the pain that a patients are experiencing and more importantly, how that pain is affecting their function. So in 2020 and 2021, we came up with a new functional assessment tool here at the University of Tennessee Medical Center called the Tennessee Functional Status Questionnaire. And what makes this tool unique is a few things. Number one, it just involves five questions. So it's very easy to administer at the bedside or in the office while patients are waiting for you. Number two, it asks patients to describe their functional activity levels by choosing from a column of activities um, of activities that are grouped according to metabolic equivalents. So a quick refresher on metabolic equivalents or METs is that metabolic equivalents are essentially multiples of your baseline metabolic rate. 
your baseline metabolic rate is how much oxygen you consume while at rest. So if you think about exercise levels, you're typically exercising at multiples of your baseline metabolic rate, one, two, three, four mets, et cetera. So one of the um, key literature points that we found is that patients, for example, who are only able to perform at less than four times their metabolic rate, say they're not able to climb a flight of stairs, so that's so technically equivalent to four METs, they tend to have higher risk of cardiovascular um, complications with surgery and higher risk of mortality and morbidity in general. So what our team decided to do was see if we could group functional activity levels into columns of activities that patients could self-select. And by there, we could identify what that patient's activity level was with, relate, with relation to metabolic equivalents and that could be compared with that patient over time. It could also be compared across patients. Another component of this functional status questionnaire that makes it a bit unique is it mentions measures two components of functional status. See, functional status is not just what you can do on your best day or your functional capacity, but very importantly, functional status also incorporates what you do on a daily basis. If, for example, you can climb a flight of stairs, but you take the elevator every day, your functional performance is gonna be lower than your functional capacity. So we actually activate or e evaluate both of those components in, with this tool. So as mentioned, the tool has five questions, functional performance, what you can do or what you do on your usual day, functional capacity, which is what you can do on your best day. And then we also identify factors that we know can be affected by or lead to decreases in function. Things such as changes in activity, pain affecting function, or recent acute care, such as hospitalization, emergency department visit, or surgery. So what we're gonna do next is we're gonna review what our patient reported as his functional status according to the TFSQ. So with answer to question one, what does he do usually in a day? He um, selected column A, which column A's activities, if you remember from the previous slide, equilibrate or are equivalent to less than three metabolic equivalents on average. In terms of his functional capacity, what he can do on his best day, he answered column B, which is three to less than four METs. Again, choosing from that grouping of activities and figuring out what matched what he could do on his best day. In terms of um, co a column or question number three, change in activity, he said that in the last 60 days, he's actually been less active than he was previous to baseline. And then in TFSQ4, pain affecting function, we know for a fact that he's coming in with pain. So yes, his pain has affected his function. Finally, for the last question, TFSQ5, he has not answered that he's been to any emergency department, hospital, or surgery in the last 60 days. So that's good. He hasn't had a further hit to his functional status. But that gives you an objective overview of this patient's functional status, a snapshot at this point in time that we can then use to guide our um, decision making and some of our goals, which you'll talk about a little bit later. Absolutely love that. And I hope you don't mind if I steal that for my own Please practice, because that's <laughs> absolutely, that absolutely is so helpful. And it just like the script history, it's a great way to really summarize how a patient is doing. Um, as we look at this patient, he has a disease process that I know that we have both treated or we treat often in our practice, and it's failed back surgery syndrome, or what was formerly called post laminectomy syndrome. And can you talk a little bit about some of the risk factors that you would see in a patient like this who may be in an under-resourced area or may be under-resourced themselves, and also some of the surgical factors that could lead to someone having failed back surgery syndrome. Absolutely. So first off, let's define what failed back surgery syndrome is, because it's very important to note that this does not mean that any particular surgeon or otherwise has done anything wrong. So it's important to acknowledge that. This is a indication where a patient has had a surgery, but it has persisted, but pain has persisted despite surgical intervention, or it may appear after the surgical intervention because of the different ways that the body heals or progresses or the disease progresses after surgery. So in terms of preoperative risk factors, we know that there are, um, the data shows or the literature shows that there are some risk factors that are more associated with fail back surgery syndrome than others. Anyone who has psychiatric comorbidity, particularly depression and anxiety that is untreated or undertreated, are more likely to develop this persistent post-surgical pain after spine surgery. There's also uh, individuals who may have poor psychosocial well-being, 
obesity, which is of course a risk factor for uh, complications after multiple different interventions, not just spine surgery, smoking the same, which can affect healing and especially um, long-term outcomes. Um, interestingly, patients who are involved in litigation or workman's comp claims can have an increased incidence of failback surgery syndrome, and the jury can be out in terms of whether that is a physiologic failback surgery syndrome or some other reason for that. And then patients who've had history of prior back surgeries. The more back surgeries you have does not necessarily mean the better you're going to be, but sometimes these surgeries are, many times these surgeries are indicated because of other physiological or anatomic um, uh, presentations. And so we have to make sure that we're first and foremost treating the patient safely, but understanding that these patients may be at risk for developing persistent pain after surgery. Um, what have been some of the preoperative risk factors that you've seen in your patient population? Um, anything that we haven't covered on this list? No, I think you really, you really nailed it. I think smoking is a big one. Um, you know, in, in Arkansas, a lot of our patients still do smoke. And we've tried to really limit their smoking as much as possible prior to going into surgery. I would say another is lack of a support system. Um, and in this patient, it, you know, we know that he was recently divorced. We don't know if that was before or after his surgery. But patients who really don't have support or either don't have buy-in themselves into the surgical process, I often find don't really do well. Um, and and we try to, and, and unfortunately, there's not much you can do for some of those patients because unfortunately, it's not really like they're choosing to have surgery. Their pains reach the point where there really is no other option. And so we just have to make sure that we follow up with them as much as possible and provide as much of that support net as we can as a practice. Yeah, I agree. Uh, uh, can you, you know, kind of Looking at a patient like this or with failed uh, failed back surgery syndrome, one of the challenges is it's almost a diagnosis of exclusion. And we have to make sure that we're not missing some other cause of pain and labeling all their pain based on their back surgery. Can you talk a little bit about how you differentiate whether this is failed back surgery syndrome or whether this is something else? Well, the ways that we evaluate our patients through three core components, which I'm sure all of our listeners are currently using in their practice, is just how you use it, right? The first is a really good history. That's where your script history comes from. The second is a thorough physical exam, which is what we were able to try to accomplish with the exam presented today. And the third is tests or imaging, which we don't have on this patient. So before I made the full diagnosis for this patient, I would want to see what imaging he had available to see if there were any anatomic causes of pain that would potentially contribute to or be an explanation for the pain that he was experiencing. And so that's where we come into the um, next component, which is looking at the different potential causes of pain that could potentially be um, uh, uh, presenting in this patient. Before we go into potential causes of pain, I actually want to skip ahead to discussing the different types of pain that can present, and that falls into that targeted pain treatment paradigm that I alluded to earlier today. So targeted pain treatment is a process of accurately diagnosing all of the causes of underlying pain and then targeting the treatment to the cause, remembering that pain is a symptom of an underlying condition. So when I mentioned that we want to make sure we've identified all of the causes, and for example, we don't have imaging to look at some of the causes of pain, that is because you can group causes of pain into four broad categories, physiologic causes of pain or how the body processes pain signals, anatomic causes of pain, such as the actual structures, bones, joints, nerves, and so on that can contribute to pain, functional causes of pain, which are basically the way either pain is affecting function or the way function is affecting or causing pain and then psychosocial components that contribute to pain. Now, all of these different causes of pain can be present in the same patient at the same point in time. So our job as clinicians is to be able to identify as many and all of those causes of pain present in our patient at a given point in time. Once we've identified those causes of pain, then we can use a multimodal treatment approach to make sure we're accurately treating each and every one of those causes because treating the holistic patient is going to give us the best chance of improving their function as you are assessing on that TFSQ, that functional status questionnaire. So in terms of um, 
multimodal treatment approach, I use the acronym MIPS. It helps me remember to make sure I'm not missing any one component of potential treatment. So MIPS stands for medications, interventions, physical therapy, and psychosocial treatment. Our medications target the physiologic cause of pain. And so that's with the way the body processes those pain signals. Interventions will target the anatomic causes of pain, which we mentioned before, nerves, joints, muscles, et cetera. And physical therapy targets those functional components or limitations that are caused by pain. And finally, the S is for psychosocial, and that targets the psychosocial comorbidity associated with the pain. So with that framework in mind, let's talk about some potential causes of pain in this particular patient. And if you'd like to go over those, Dr. Gori, we can kind of have a back and forth discussion about it. Yeah, I mean, when you when you look at a patient like this, um, you know, he has both pain when you're palpating his spine, but then he also has a radicular component to his pain. And so I think really diving into what is potentially causing the most limitation as you look at his functional pain scale, um, I think would be helpful because you want to kind of target the thing that's going to get you the most mileage or the most bang for your buck. Because as you just pointed out, the treatments for his axial pain may be different than the treatments for his neuropathic pain. Um, I think it's also really important to really dig into how his pain has progressed over time. And is that is that neuropathic pain or that axial pain, was it present before the surgery? Did it get worse or better after the surgery? And how has it progressed over the last two years to really understand kind of how the basically the arc of his symptomatology is? Also, what the medications work for. You know, he's taking a over-the-counter remedy, a common Southern over-the-counter remedy for his pain control. And is that helping his axial pain? Is that helping his radicular pain or both? Uh, because that may also change kind of how you would move forward. And then also really making sure that he doesn't have anything on his uh, assessment that would make him a candidate for another surgery. Um, a lot of times we have patients who end up in our offices because they've lost faith in surgery or they've lost faith in surgeons because they've gone to the well, they've been promised that things are going to work extremely well for them and that they're going to be back to their normal function. And they're actually worse off. And so the last person they often want to see in that situation is another surgeon. Uh, but there are certain times when patients do need to have surgery. And if they have instability on imaging, if they have changes to bowel or bladder sy sy symptoms, if they have um, weight loss, if they have signs of malignancy, if there's anything that really tips you off or even progressive weakness, as you see, I know this patient does have some weakness. If that's getting worse over time or getting worse fairly rapidly, then there may be something going on that may require this patient to see a surgeon. Um, can you uh, kind of apply that framework to this patient and kind of talk about his specific findings and kind of how you would use kind of that targeted pain treatment framework to really come up with a, to understand what's going on and potentially a treatment plan for this patient. Absolutely. So let's talk about those four causes of pain and see what our patient has in terms of that, right? So first off, the physiologic cause of pain, how the body processes pain signals. We know he's got um, pain in the low back, which is more of a muscular kind of a spasmodic almost type of pain, which is tender to palpation. So that's a component of peripheral sensitization and also a component of inflammation in the back locally. But he also has a burning pain down the leg with a positive straight leg raise too. So that is a component of neuropathic pain, right? Next, in terms of anatomic causes of pain, he's got pain that is following an L4 and an L5 dermatome down that right leg in particular with that positive straight leg raise. So we're suspecting there may be some compression of that L4 nerve root. Unfortunately, we don't have any imaging to confirm that yet. So that wouldn't be something we'd consider as part of our treatment plan. In terms of the functional components of pain, we know that the pain is worse with walking and he has difficulty with simple daily activities. We also know that his functional performance is about the lowest it can be. It's less than three metabolic equivalents. So he's very, very limited in terms of his function. He's got limited range of motion and he also has an abnormal gait because of the pain. And then finally, we do have a psychosocial contributing factor to his pain too, several actually. He has persistent smoking. He has a nicotine addiction. He's smoking a pack and a half a day despite being advised to quit. 
He's also had his, a loss of his job. There's some depression and then recent divorce. All of those things factor into a person's perception and, and, and ability to cope with pain because of the psychosocial burden that those things create. So those are his physiologic, anatomic, and functional and psychosocial components of pain that we are dealing with. Thank you. And I look forward to seeing what the treatment for this patient would be. But before we do that, we're going to ask a question from our audience. Which of the following is a potential barrier to achieving optimal outcomes care based on this patient's history? All right, before we move on to treatment, let's review our SMART goals for this activity. So one is we really wanna avoid the use of opioids for the long term for patients like this, just for the management of low back pain. And we also wanna make sure that we're recommending pharmacologic and non-pharmacologic treatment options as a part of a multimodal treatment plan for patients who have low back pain. And when we apply those SMART goals directly to this patient, I think it's really important to really look to how you can increase this patient's function. Because from our history, it seems that we have a patient who has had an unfortunate event or an unfortunate series of events in their life, and they've gone from basically functioning at a very high level to functioning at a very low level and functioning really in column A and functioning at less than three METs. So a really specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and timely goal for this patient would be to increase his functional performance from column A to column B. And to make that measurable, let's plan to do that within the next 60 days. And so Dr. Vanderpool, my last question for you and looking at a patient like this that you would see in your practice, how would you apply kind of the MIPS, the MIPS framework to create a comprehensive treatment plan for him? Very good question. So we've already identified um, the different causes of pain that are present, the physiologic, anatomic, functional, and psychosocial components of pain. And very importantly, we've come up with a SMART goal for our patient, which is to improve his functional performance, which is his daily activity level from less than three METs to three to less than four METs. So just to move him up one column, we're not trying to make him run marathons in 60 days. We're just trying to increase his functional performance. So with that, we want to make sure that we're treating the underlying causes of pain as precisely as possible. So let's go through that MIPS framework and just figure out what we can do at each section to improve our patient's pain control and function. With regards to medication, we identified that the physiologic causes of pain that were most prominent were a bit of a muscular pain, which is a combination of inflammatory and come some peripheral muscle spasm, and also a neuropathic pain. So what we recommend is we would probably add or consider adding a muscle relaxer to address that spasm or that uh, axial back pain and spasm. And then also encourage the patient to resume regular gabapentin dosing. Remember, he was prescribed the gabapentin 300 milligrams twice a day, but wasn't taking it. So we wouldn't have a conversation, encourage him and explain why that gabapentin may be beneficial for his leg pain. In terms of an inflammatory benefit, we may consider switching him from the aspirin and caffeine, which he was taking, which really increased his risk of GI perforation ulceration because of the amount of aspirin product and maybe switching him to ibuprofen 600 to 800 milligrams three times a day with a PPI or a proton pump inhibitor to protect his stomach lining. In terms of uh, hydrocodone, he's already not taking it very much because it makes him feel sick, but also it's important to note that hydrocodone or opioids in general do not treat the underlying cause of pain. They just really kind of cover it up. So if we're able to treat the causes or the physiologic causes of pain more precisely, as we've described above, we can reduce or eliminate our needs for opioids by taking that off of the plate of uh, treatment plans for his physiologic or his medications. In terms of his interventions, remember interventions treat the anatomic cause of pain. We really have a suspicion of what the anatomic cause of pain is in terms of what his physical exam shows and suspecting an L4 or L5 radiculopathy, but we do not have any updated imaging after his surgery. So the first step would be to update our imaging of the lumbar spine, ideally an uh, MRI, which would give us information in terms of the level of detail that would be needed as a primary care physician would want to then refer out to a specialist. The specialist would have the information you need to determine um, a specific treatment plan that can target that anatomic cause of pain very precisely. 
Important to know though, that whenever we're talking about spine interventions, it is critical for our patients to hold or not be taking any anticoagulant medications. And the dose of aspirin that our patient is currently on would be considered an anticoagulating dose and would increase his risk for any type of epidural or um, hematoma for a spine procedure. Therefore, we would need to make sure to reiterate to our patient that they cannot be taking any aspirin product um, or any anticoagulant within a certain amount of time prior to the interventional procedure. In the case of aspirin, that would be a seven-day hold. In terms of physical therapy, we can have the patient review either home or in-person options for physical therapy. Since he has transportation issues, home-based physical therapy may be a good place to start so that we can increase compliance for this patient. But then once we're able to improve his function or if his um, a transportation situation changes, we know that outpatient physical therapy has potentially more resources and equipment that may help this patient move along quicker. Um, we also have set a functional goal for this patient. So in addition to increasing his functional performance from less than three METs to three to four less than four METs, we can actually quantify that. We can say we want him to be able to walk to the mailbox and backs three times a day. That's kind of a functional goal that we can set that the patient can get behind and measure for themselves um, as they're working towards this progress. Finally, when it comes to the S or the psychosocial treatment, again, having that conversation with this patient about smoking cessation and how much it plays into not only his current pain, but any future healing that he has to do. And then consider psychiatric or psychological support for the patient in terms of his depression, particularly with regards to job loss, divorce, and overall depressive symptoms. And that can be done either in person or via telemedicine in many areas. So that would be your MIPS treatment plan for this patient. And that's a treatment plan that our primary care colleagues can definitely initiate and then work in collaboration with our specialty colleagues to get this patient the care that they need. I really appreciate how you put all that together and how concise and organized that treatment plan is. And I think that in our specialty, we often do a really good job at the first two at medications and interventions, but I don't think we can underscore how important the last two are and making sure that you're improving their function through physical therapy, but also treating the patient more holistically and understanding that his smoking and his lack of support and, uh, really do contribute to his pain pathology. So thank you for that. I want to address the audience and just remember to please be sure to check out our other briefcase in the series focused on the use of opioid risk assessment tools in pain management. These activities, as well as many other educational resources, can be found online at CME Outfitters Opioid and Virtual Education Hubs. To receive continuing education credit for completing today's activity, participants must complete the post-test and evaluation online. I'd like to thank Dr. Vanterpool for joining me in this case. I'd also like to thank all of you for participating in this activity and for really working to provide the best care for our patients. We appreciate your time and attention, and please have a great day. Thank you.